Good afternoon, and welcome to the Employee Hygiene 2020, the State of the Market for Food Facilities webinar presented by QA and Meritech. We will have two sessions in today's webinar. I will host and present the opening session, Contemporary Best Practices in Employee Hygiene and Food Facilities, and Meritech Chief Technology Officer and Head Engineer Paul Barnhill will present a session on hygiene as a measure of corporate social responsibility. We welcome any questions, but ask that you type them into the box on your screen. The presenters will then address the questions at the end of their presentations. So to provide you with a brief bio on myself, I am Lisa Lupo. I have more than 30 years of food industry experience, including positions with Quality Assurance and Food Safety, QA Magazine, the Atchison Group, and LJ Writing Services. I have spoken internationally on industry best practices, trends, and consumer perspectives. I am a published author and hold advisory positions with various industry organizations. This session focuses on contemporary best practices with a key focus on the survey that we conducted earlier this year and an analysis of the results. Um, COVID-19, discussing the impact of the pandemic and resulting changes in employee hygiene, and some best practices to take a look at what companies have done both before and during the pandemic to help improve hygiene. So let's talk about the survey. In early February, QA conducted a survey of its readers as sponsored by Meritech on hygiene practices and perspectives. The responses are based on 198 respondents whose company has at least one food facility. As you can see in these tables as well, the respondents had fewer than five, most respondents had fewer than five facilities, but there were also a number who had many more than that. And represented in the survey were a number of management positions, primarily those in QA and food safety. It is important to note that this was prior to any U.S. community spread of the virus, and it was well before the facilities had begun to implement precautions. So with the further emphasis that has been put on these areas during the pandemic, it's likely that um, we will see a post-COVID world, both within and outside the food industry, that places an even greater emphasis on hygiene than is reflected in the survey results that we are presenting. In fact, you will also see that as we discuss the best practices. So even before the increased practices of the pandemic, this industry really has had a major excuse me, emphasis on hygiene as an aspect of food safety, and particularly in hand washing. As you can see in the table, there were no respondents that ranked hand washing personal hygiene or ill worker separation from food as unimportant in their facility. So even before COVID came around, when combined, more than 90% of the respondents ranked most of the key aspects of personal hygiene as being important or very important. However, it is somewhat concerning that only 72% ranked shoe or boot sanitation as important or very important, but we will come back to that. So given the overall importance that food facilities place on employee hygiene, our survey showed that all the respondents, 100%, have set employee hygiene standards. 95% of those have the standards in writing, 94%, I'm sorry. Of those 94%, then 98% have a written hand washing policy and 51 a shoe and boot policy that's written. But even with these in writing, only 86% provided employees with any education on the policies or explanation of the why behind them. So let's take a closer look at the training and education. With a focus on hand washing, we said that 98% had a written policy, but we also learned from the survey that 98% um, train their employees on that policy. And of those facilities that provide hand washing training, 89% train them upon hire, 
But after that, the training and retraining slips off quite a bit at most facilities. Although 75% said that they do conduct regular food safety training, the definition of regular seems to be quite variable in regards to hand washing. As you can see on this slide here, 40, uh, I'm sorry, 52%, okay, sorry, I got off. Um, more than half, right, train on hand washing only once a year or less. And only 11% provide monthly or weekly training. But facilities do provide other training and retraining, such as the signage they put at hand washing sinks and explanation in the employee handbooks. So we would expect that signage that looks something like this is probably what appears at hand washing stations. And the training may include the directive to wash your hands for about 20 seconds, perhaps um, emphasizing the singing of the ABCs or singing happy birthday twice, or even if I, as I've heard from some people, singing your state college fight song works to come down to about the right timing. So we asked survey participants, how long should hands be washed? Specifically, we said, if hands are washed manually, how long should this take? Now, in this case, we did not ask what the company policy was. Rather, we wanted to know what the general understanding was of the survey participants on hand washing. And remember, 91% are in management positions, and most of those are in QA or food safety, and many are likely responsible for that training. But given that, only 84% of the respondents knew that hands should be washed for at least 20 seconds. As you can see, 16% felt that 15 seconds or less was sufficient to ensure that hands are clean. So of those, even more concerning is the 3% who said until they look clean was good enough. So we can hope that those who responded that were the ones that were non-management respondents, but even if that's the case, it would mean that the training was not sufficient in those facilities for the workers to know that at least 20 seconds of scrubbing is needed. CDC does a good job of addressing the why on hand washing. So if you think any of your workers or your managers have questions on it, this graphic, um, which is available from cdc.gov, provides a bit of a graphic element along with the instruction to show that even if your hands look clean, they could still have germs. But once again, we want to reiterate that the survey was conducted prior to the spread of COVID-19. So it's likely that with all the repeated messages that are being given both in the home and in public and in the workplace, it's likely more well-known than it was in the past. And it's also an area that we're likely to see focus retained well into the new normal of the post-pandemic era. If we switch over to gloves, in many facilities, gloves are required and they might be required only for workers or 78% actually require them for anyone who comes into the processing area, whether that be an employee or a visitor. But even when gloves are worn, there are standards and regulations for hand washing requirements, even though it may seem overkill to some. So the Code of Federal, Regula Code of Federal Regulations says that personnel who handle or contact covered produce or food contact surfaces are required to wash hands thoroughly before putting on gloves. And the industry really does quite well here. As the other um, chart shows, 90%, 93% of respondents do follow that practice. And 31% of those also require that hands be washed after donning gloves. But according to the Conference for Food Protection, there are some exceptions. So if you have an employee that needs to change the gloves, and they will be performing the same task and there will be no increased risk of cross-contamination, then they don't necessarily need to wash their hands in between that change. 
So let's take a look back again at the respondents ranking of the importance of various aspects of hygiene. When you consider it as a whole, we also find the food industry really is on the right track with 93% ranking personal hygiene as important or very important. But as we said, 72% rank uh, shoe and boot sanitation as important. With 11% giving it little importance and 3% saying it has no importance at all, we see that shoe and boot sanitation is the considered the least important. And as a result, those facilities, 34% of them had no footwear hygiene systems and 57% also did not provide boot or shoe covers. It's interesting to note though that, that we did ask in the survey about recalls and incidents that the facilities had had, and there were very few who did. But of those who had had any hygiene related incident, a total of 63% did increase their footwear practices afterward by either increasing the boot and shoe washing or and or adding a captive boot program. So this, it is important to see that, that people do realize the importance of footwear hygiene. And we will come back to that um, one more time in a further slide. One other area though that we asked about with hygiene was whether or not the facility communicates to employees that it is acceptable to miss work if ill. Once again, we have to remember that this was pre-COVID and there have been many changes resulting during COVID, which will likely remain afterwards. Um, but even before, 95% did let employees know that it was acceptable to stay home when sick. And of those, 63% provided sick leave for four floor workers. 32% did not. But then came COVID, which as you all know, has carried a major impact on personal hygiene requirements. So now we're going to discuss some of those changes. When it started, we often spoke about the new normal that we expected to be living post COVID. But having lived this now for over half a year and seeing no real end in sight, I'd say we're already living our new normal. So there are things that have been implemented that are likely to stay for a while. How much is yet to be determined but it's likely that many of the preventive measures we are now employing and posting signage, as, as you can see here, will certainly remain, um, at least in some food facilities, to help keep food safety and, and employee health at their best. But let's look at the changes that directly impact the areas that we discussed in the survey. So those would be the hand hygiene, the gloves, the footwear, and sick leave. So relating to hands, some of the um, hygiene has always been critical in the food industry, but businesses have been increasing their practices throughout the pandemic. And just a couple examples of these, um, Aladdin Baking Company created a full COVID-19 protection policy, which included some very specific hand washing practices that were increased from prior. Both the frequency of hand washing and the training they implemented were increased and non-compliance could even get a person sent home for the day. Um, MZB, a coffee producer, also increased hand hygiene training. They also receive a half pallet of hand sanitizer in the facility each week, just for the worker use. A company called Just the Cheese, they have now um, added sanitizer stations at every entry door. And there's a full policy that goes along with that with the workers sanitizing their hands before they punch the keypad and sanitizing again, going directly to the break room to put away anything they brought in and then washing hands again. Anybody working in a high care area then also washes to the elbow and dons arm sleeves, gloves, hairnet and bear net as needed. So again, always had practices, but have really increased these. 
In relation to footwear, um, we're seeing more a number of studies that are showing that footwear can carry pathogens and viruses. And much of the research has taken place in healthcare facilities, but they are just as, a, just as applicable to food facilities. In the first case shown here, um, the floors were swabbed for the virus that causes COVID-19. And with shoes of the ICU staff testing positive, they also though found that all samples in some non-patient areas such as the pharmacy tested positive. So from this, the researchers deduced that the soles of the shoes could function as carriers and thus recommended that the shoe soles be disinfected. Um, in, in this case, before the workers left the ICU, but in any case, in a food facility, you know, prior to entering the food operation area. In another study, um, a literature review, they found 13 studies that supported the transmission of pathogens on shoe soles. And with the pathogens found on the bottoms of shoes of food workers, among others, this shows a need for prevention in this area as well. When we talk about sick leave, um, while the food industry has always been more aware of the issues of ill workers being in the workplace, and some likely having at least cursory policies on that, but the pandemic really brought about a whole new thing with wellness checks. We no longer relied on people just to self-report. Rather, we began taking temperatures and asking health questions before allowing workers or visitors into the facility. I had also mentioned that 32% of those surveyed said they did not provide sick leave for, for, for floor workers. But with the new requirements of the family first coronavirus response, this is likely to be an area that we could very likely see some post COVID changes. Um, whether those are regulatory requirements that are implemented or industry, industry standards, or simply need to be done because of a competitive environment of others um, having sick leave for their workers. And masks are likely the most interesting hygiene aspect to come out of COVID-19. But despite expert recommendations that masks do reduce the risk of viral spread and the commonality and endorsement of mask usage in other parts of the world, such as shown in these quotes here, mask wearing has been stigmatized and politicized in the US. So it will be interesting to see what happens afterward as the general population of the US is likely to shed their masks as soon as it's possible and permissible. But it will be interesting to see if masks remain as a preventive measure in food facilities in whatever our new normal ends up bringing us. So from that, we will jump over to some best practices. Some of these are based on uh, COVID practices and some are things that facilities have always done. And but developing policies and gaining employee buy-in and compliance isn't always easy. So in this, section, we're not just addressing what some of the things that have been done, but how companies have actually enticed compliance for these and what you can do in your own facility. One of the best ways to entice compliance on just about anything is to make it easy. So if a person has to go out of their way to do something, they're more likely to just skip it. So MZB added hand washing stations in the break area and in strategic locations around the plant, the production floor. And this made hand washing more convenient for the workers. It used portable stations to reduce expense and any extra need for plumbing. And who doesn't like recognition and rewards? So in MB, MZB's Caught Working Safely program, to promote safe work habits, supervisors give employees a card every time they observe someone working safely or correctly washing hands, which was added with the pandemic. The cards are put in a box 
and a prize winner is drawn each month. And providing in this type of incentive to do it right and helping to drill also helps to drill home the importance of good hygiene, GMPs, and worker safety. Another best practice came from a German field study. Um, it was conducted based on the idea that humans modify their behavior in a socially desirable way when being watched by others. It assumes then the social desirability of hand hygiene. So the researchers created two versions of a hand washing placard, which they placed in women's public restrooms. One had a stylized image of humans of human eyes as though they were watching, and the other in another restroom, it had three stars instead of the eyes. The result in the restroom with the eyes. 83% of the people washed their hands after using the restroom. In the other restroom, only 72% did. Um, another best practice we can take from Smithfield Foods, who has been building food safety culture for years. Um, and so they've built hygiene into the culture as well. So how do you do this? What they do is start out, number one, you give food safety the highest priority, ensuring that top management walks the walk. Then you fully empower every employee to create a culture of, of accountability. Focus food safety controls to each application individually, such as the hygiene, and consider your most valuable ROI to be your people. This culture, though, then needs to be maintained every day, every week, every month, year after year. FDA also had some incentivizing advice, um, starting with training. Create opportunities to remind your employees about the importance of hand hygiene and do this regularly. Then make them aware also of media coverage of foodborne outbreaks to help reinforce the need for hand washing and to uh, reinforce the need to report symptoms and illnesses. Then prioritize. When management enforces hand washing compliance as a mandatory requirement, employees are more likely to comply. After that, though, then motivate using incentive programs such as the one that we showed with MZB to encourage employees to take ownership and practice good hygiene. And then try a buddy up system. Use the buddy system in which fellow food employees support each other. In a column in QA Magazine, the late Ole Doslin cited Albert Einstein to support his 4E approach. Um, Einstein had said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So based on that, Oli had said, educate by educating on what is expected and then empowering your workforce to do what is needed and enforcing the practice as is needed will lead to an effective system. So it emphasizes education rather than training because it is the why of education that goes much further than the what. So let's look at an example of that and use masks. Most states and businesses are requiring masks still. And you could just stop there and say, it's what is the rule. So you will do it because it's required. Or you could go on to educate and explain as this infographic poster shows, the virus is expelled in droplets as we sing, as we talk, or sing or shout or even breathe. And if one person wears a mask, the distribution of those droplets is reduced. If both people wear masks, the distribution is significantly reduced. And if you are also six feet apart, there's very little chance of the droplets reaching that far, all of which reduces the risk of transmitting COVID. So by explaining the why we're doing what we do, it helps people understand and better comply in most cases. But of all the things that you can do to entice compliance, walking the walk is among the most important. 
As QA columnist and advisory board member, Bruce Ferry said, how you behave needs to support your message. Think about what you do and say and the impact that it has on your workers. If you are seen as one who is, who is seen as do as I say, not as I do, your employees will see through it and you will have lost their trust. Transparency has also become the way of the world in many things and communication within the facility is no different. Your team needs information to be able to meet their commitments and your expectations. And being transparent not only builds trust, it fosters a collaborative environment. And within that transparency then is relaying the why. Once the why is understood, your team is that much more likely to follow the rules and procedures. So we generally have a moderator at this point who would present the questions to me, but since I'm the moderator on this one, I'll take a look at the questions that have come in and provide um, the answers that I have. So, yes, I see that one. They talked about Smithfield getting sued for not protecting their workers from COVID. Um, I think what, again, we want to reiterate is this was pre-COVID and these were things being done. And there's also quite a bit of um, difficulty in the meat facilities on protecting the workers because of the distancing. And I know that it's being, um, you know, there are some things I, the case is still pending, I know, and I don't honestly know enough about it to really say a lot about it. I did think of that when I put the slide in and maybe should have skipped it, but I still thought that the practice um, was a good one in general. COVID has just brought a lot of things to the forefront that we've never had to deal with before and made things more difficult. Um, So it says, what do you think is the biggest challenge when it comes to hand hygiene compliance? And is there a way to automate hand hygiene compliance? Um, the first part of the question, I think part of the challenge is people, the, the whole aspect of it looks clean and you know we're, we're kind of used to that and the fact that this is the way I've always done it which is kind of a typical response to anything um, so solutions to that I think would be just helping you know helping the understanding I really feel that the more that we can show people that your hands aren't necessarily clean even though they look clean the better off we'll be and to the second part of that of automating, I am going to pass that one over to Paul Barnhill when he takes his chance, because I know that um, that they have some symptoms there. Uh, trying to see the questions. Okay. Um, all right, other questions. Um, we did have questions that asked where the state of the market report can be accessed, and that is on the QA website, which is qualityassurancemag.com. And if you go to the issue up in the corner and click on current issue and go to the May, June 2020 issue, you will, um, it's in there and all the articles that were cited in here and more information on it is there. So we are coming up to time for our next session. Any further questions that were on there that were not addressed, um, we will will be passed on to me and we can provide answers directly to whomever has asked them. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. And that is Paul Barnhill. He has, oh, sorry, he has over 28 years of experience working with professionals in food manufacturing, healthcare, and food service. Paul is a human hygiene expert and CTO at Meritech. He often speaks on best practices in hand hygiene, footwear sanitation, and the science behind pathogen removal. Prior to joining Meritech, he worked at Medtronic in the 
hemostasis division as a mechanical designer within the R&D department. Paul will be speaking on hygiene as a measure of corporate social responsibility. Paul. Hello, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, Lisa, very much. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to everybody today. So um, yeah, just really quickly of, of who I am, and thank you, Lisa, for the great introduction. Um, I've spent about the last three decades uh, working in the human hygiene arena and really focused on creating technologies that improve human hygiene, both looking at how you can take that engineering and science um, and blend those two together, as well as then looking at that behavioral piece to really see what uh, drives that. So let me go ahead and get this slide going to the next one. There we go. So let's go ahead and jump into our webinar quickly, kind of go over the topics we're going to cover today, which is hygiene is a measure of corporate social responsibility. Meritech is headquartered in Golden, Colorado and founded in Colorado 30 years ago. All our hygiene stations and solutions are manufactured in the United States. We have a dedicated team of hygiene experts throughout the United States. Meritech also has key partnerships in our international markets. As experts in human hygiene, we focused on creating innovative technologies that address the pitfalls in human behaviors to improve hygiene and throughput for many organizations. So let's kind of go over the history of hygiene. There's a vast history of hygiene, and it only began some 174 years ago and is ever so important in the current times we're in. So in 1946, in Vienna, Dr. Emil Samuel Weiss was working in maternity wards where he observed the mortality rate in the wards cared for by physicians and medical students were as much as three times greater than that where that care was provided by midwives. Samuel Weiss found that the students were coming straight from the pathology lab without washing their hands. He believed that they were carrying infections from the lab to their patients. When he implemented a hand washing protocol, his mortality rate dropped to less than 1%. In 1853, the Crimean War brought out a new hand washing champion, Florence Nightingale. At a time when most people believed that infections were caused by foul odors or miasmas, Florence Nightingale implemented hand washing and other hygiene practices in the war hospital in which she worked. While the target of the practices was to fight the miasmas, Nightingale's hand washing practices achieved a reduction in the infections. In 1961, the US Public Health Service produced a training film that demonstrated hand washing techniques recommended for use by healthcare workers. In 1985, formal written guidelines on hand washing practices in hospitals were published by the CDC. These guidelines recommended hand washing with non antimicrobial soap between the majority of patient contacts and washing with antimicrobial soap before and after performing invasive procedures or caring for those patients that are at high risk. The use of waterless or antiseptics or alcohol gel sanitizers was only recommended in those situations where sinks were not available to wash. In 1992, OSHA shored up the hand washing guidelines, spelling out more detailed specifications on when and how a person should wash or sanitize based on the circumstances. In 2012, the International Association for Food Protection releases a study that illustrates the superior effectiveness of hand washing that includes the use of soap and which, the, which lasts at least 20 seconds for that hand washing event. The study also demonstrated that towel drying is more effective than air drying, which is ever so present in the current times we're in. With all the known history of the importance of proper hand washing, it's surprising that most people don't consistently wash their hands correctly. So what is the problem? People are not washing correctly and not long enough. We learned a little bit about that from what Lisa presented earlier. But here's a couple of studies I want to kind of point out that really bring this to light. A study conducted by the USDA found consumers fail to correctly wash their hands 97% of the time, with most common mistake being not washing hands long enough. 
hygiene report from Michigan State University also said it found that 33% of people didn't use soap when washing their hands, while 10% didn't wash their hands at all. Now, some of these reports are not maybe directly related to food. They may be directly related to just observations of personal hygiene, but that kind of stems when you're away from home or away from work hand hygiene. So you have to kind of keep those in mind when you're thinking about the overall aspects of hand hygiene. So now that we know the history was, but let's talk about today. As we saw in the history of hand washing slide, COVID-19 is not the first pandemic that we have faced. However, hand washing has always been important for food manufacturing as hygiene has always been a life or death situation for their consumers. However, today we see more awareness on the importance of hand hygiene as the first line of defense as we become more of a global society. Hand washing is one of the items that everyone agrees on is the most significant in reducing risk because the science and the data backs it up. Both organizations and businesses are now promoting good hand hygiene and manually washing your hands properly for 20 seconds or using an automated hygiene system for 12 seconds to really combat the problem of proper hand hygiene. Hand washing awareness has reached a global popularity through social media trends and celebrity support. As a result of the pandemic, there are now hand washing songs for all age levels from the Baby Shark song for toddlers to Neil Diamond's Hands Washing Hands song. Hand washing has also gained popularity from social media trends such as World Health Organization's Safe Hands Challenge, which celebrates or which celebra celebrities like Selena Gomez also participated in. Businesses teaming up with celebrities and using social media to promote hand washing awareness and demonstrate their support of hand washing and hygiene. Here's a sample video from Dove's Wash to Care campaign with DJ Khalid. Let's go ahead and watch this video. Go ahead and cue up the video. Asab, what are we gonna do? Wash your hands. Let me see, come on. All right. We the cleanest. Postman. DJ Left hand, right hand. Yeah. Put it in the sink. Front hand, back hand. Right with hand. some soap in between. Yeah. Wash your hands, clean them up. 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 Yeah. Baby, step back. I don't want that. Limited that. Six uh -huh. feet. Baby, step back. I don't want that. We the cleanest. Fantastic. I mean, that is absolutely uh, exciting to see, and it really does get people really just, you know, pumped up to really wash their hands. So proper hand hygiene is a society global responsibility and is the new norm. We as humans need to protect ourselves and our fellow humans by properly washing our hands. This is why corporations are more aware of their responsibility to provide the proper means for good hygiene practices for their employees and their consumers. This is no longer just a food manufacturing issue. Hygiene is not only the manufacturing floor worker, but also those in the front offices. It provides a healthier, safer working environment. Businesses are now not only demonstrating their support by good hygiene, but making it a priority for their business processes to demonstrate commitment to the safety and well being of their consumers. One organization we have seen demonstrate this commitment very well is United Airlines with their Clean Plus program. Let's go ahead and watch that video.
Thank you very much. So having a sound response plan, not only for a situation of a pandemic, but overall illness is, is so that it doesn't propagate through a facility is key for success. As we discussed previously, the threat of illness has always been an issue of the consumer safety for food manufacturing companies. So it's important that these solutions are not reactive or band-aid decisions as a result of a pandemic, but rather sustainable solutions to build a better hygiene culture at your facility. So what do we need to implement for a safer work environment? More closely monitoring the health of our staff, not allowing ill employees to come to work for fear of missing a paycheck, ensuring that your hygiene zones are properly maintained, making sure that your people understand the why behind the importance of good hygiene, and good training for all aspects of hand or other hygiene that is sustainable. So how do we build a sustainable long-term solution for hygiene at your facility? So it really boils down to four parts. The first and foremost, the most important piece is culture. That's where the foundation is built. You then have SOPs, SOPs that are easy to follow for staff of diverse cultures and many different languages, or also using automated systems to bridge that human behavioral gap. Then you have validation, making sure your process and so forth is working. And then obviously the pinnacle part of this is your ongoing reinforcement. So at the core of this culture is what we call a hygiene culture is a unified mindset across the organization that puts food safety at the forefront of everything done within the business, both physically and mentally. And if effective hygiene culture is in place, everything from the layout, the design of the facility, how an employee thinks about their own personal hygiene should all be considered through the lens of food safety. Creating a hygiene culture is a complicated task that requires every level of the organization, from the executive leadership, middle management, production team leaders, and production team members to be on the same page when it comes to food safety. A hygiene social contract helps establish this culture and ensures that it is agreed upon by all members of the company, regardless of their position. At the center of this culture is that hygiene social contract. Social contracts are nothing new and have been used for many years in businesses and classrooms. Even the US Constitution is a form of a social contract. Simply put, a hygiene social contract establishes a set of rules and behaviors and expectations that all employees are held to with the sole focus around hygiene. Because a hygiene contract establishes the mindset of food safety at the organization, it should be a key part of the onboarding process for new team members and builds on that foundation. It is a useful tool to introduce new team members to the hygiene culture and establish how they should think about their own personal hygiene in order to uphold the organization's food safety standards. The hygiene social contract should also be used to reinforce the hygiene culture across all levels of the organization. It should serve as a decision-making guide for everyone when considering facility layouts, operational flows, and decisions and designing SSOPs. Essentially, a culture of accountability, which should just be established so that whenever a decision is made, the decision maker asks themselves, does this follow our organization's hygiene social contract? Then we have the procedural portion of hygiene. The importance of SOPs in demonstrating hygiene, corporate social responsibility, and building on their hygiene culture. Simple to follow guides that staff can follow and walk them through the proper hygiene steps in their zones. These simple reminders go a long way in building continuity with your staff. If you're utilizing, oh my, on back one. Okay, sorry, I may have moved too many slides. There we go. If you're utilizing a clean tech hygiene station, you're a step ahead as the technology makes hygiene SOPs and compliance easier because of automation. It takes away some of that variability that needs to be accounted for in the manual hygiene process. Now we get down to, to, to validation, okay? There's a couple different ways you can validate a hygiene process. Visually monitoring staff, verifying they're going through the process consistently and taking the necessary time to do a proper job. 
Meritech for 30 years has relied on laboratory process for following an ASTM E1174 standard and referred to as the glove juice method to validate the cleantech systems to an FDA standard. However, this is difficult to do in the field. We recommend using the ATP method for testing the, in the facility. It's an immediate reference result of proper hygiene. It's really a good tool to be able to sit there and, and see how that process is being done. Meritech has a step-by-step -step white paper process for conducting this ATP testing, which we will share at the conclusion of this. And the last part of this is really about reinforcement, which is the pinnacle of the hygiene process. One of the easiest ways to reinforce proper hygiene is by making it part of the discussion throughout the year with your team. Huddle Talks is a great place to bring up hygiene. Recognizing hygiene superheroes amongst your team, hygiene should be a cornerstone of the safety days where the why behind the good hygiene is reinforced with your team. Keeping everyone involved in a lighthearted, fun way makes training easier and encourages greater commitment to proper hygiene. Like Hygiene Bingo, a fun way for everyone to be involved. So when it comes to hygiene and corporate social responsibility, 80% is the attitude that you bring to this and 20% of the tools and the processes. Main thing that you need to believe is to believe that there's a better way to address hygiene and that's your responsibility to lead and become a hygiene superhero. Your job is to take this knowledge and share it with your business and create that belief. This change will not happen overnight, but with consistent reinforcement of these four cores, it will develop in time and create a hygiene culture in your organization that is sustainable. So I want to repeat again, all the resources discussed today will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. And thank you very much. And are there any questions? Sorry about that. I needed to unmute myself. Um, the first question I'm going to give you is the one that was asked during the previous presentation um, and it talked about you know the biggest challenges when it comes to hand hygiene compliance but also is there a way to automate hand hygiene compliance because I believe that you all do have an answer to that. A absolutely and that's actually an excellent question I was going to bring that up as well. The answer to that is yes and that's what basically Meritech does or our clean tech automated hand hygiene systems do. What these systems have been able to do and prove is that they are able to wash the hands consistently for every single user at the same amount of time using the same correct amount of soap and solution directly that's been clinically validated uh, with numerous numerous studies over the years uh, challenged with things like E. coli and serration recessions and staphylococcus aureus and norovirus and many different pathogens where we can sit there and show uh, a, a realistically reduction of 99.9% .9 or greater of these dangerous pathogens in that work process. But here's the biggest advantage. Here's one of the things of why automation is key. And that's why we've done what we've done is that, you know, you go and you train and you create these processes. And unfortunately, you get a spike in that training and you get a spike in that compliance and then it starts to fall off again. So you have to go back and do that. By automating that process, uh, you're creating, uh, you know, and using that engineering and that chemistry built together to really bridge that human behavioral gap so that you get the same net effect every single user. Okay, Lisa, next question. we have some more questions. Yes, yes. Um, so you mentioned ATP testing. What other method, methods are good for hand hygiene validation? Well, it, it validation is really tough. It depends on kind of what that, that, you know, core is a, that the company is trying to achieve. I mean, you know, there's different ways you could do uh, total plate counts or so forth and so on. But the problem with that is, is that that's a, unfortunately a lot of noise. And what happens with that noise is you're seeing actually what that person's mostly is their natural flora or what is called Staphylococcus epidermis, which is the number one pathogen that's a resident pathogen on people's skin. 95% of that or greater is pretty much harmless. So you get a lot of information about that. So that's only one aspect is really on that validation is verifying that the hands are clean. One of the reasons we've we've worked hard on this um, uh, ATP methodology in the white paper we've done about it, and we're, we're doing more in the future in regards to that. More will come in the future, I can't tell much now. And, but other ways to validate is also looking at that, 
that process from behind the scenes a little bit, doing what is called maybe a secret shopper to where somebody is observing them, but they don't know they're being observed from that. And that and and so that you can kind of get that reality, especially if you're in that manual hygiene process where you're really um, wanting to not be there and watch them. If they know you're there and you're watching them, you're going to get that compliance. It's, it's called policing the behavior. Just like when you're speeding down the road and you see that cop, you immediately slow down. Well, the same thing when it comes to hand hygiene. So we want to have that secret shopper in there so that they can really um, observe from afar and see what's really happening when they're really not think they're being observed. So you make sure that you're hitting those compliance cues exactly it. But one of the biggest things to help with that is people understanding the why. Okay, another question. My company has a lot of seasonal and temporary workers. So what can I do to promote a hygiene culture with a team that won't be around very long? Well, that that's really, again, another interesting part. And there's a couple different ways you can address that. One is obviously on that onboarding process. When you have those seasonal workers, making sure that you do a hygiene workshop. You know, like you had mentioned earlier, you know, a, a good number of people are doing that in that onboarding process. But you may have to step that up a little bit, especially if you have temporary workforce, contract labor, so forth. But another way to really help with this, you know, you'd mentioned it's called the buddy system. We actually call it a team member mentor when it comes to hygiene. So when this person is coming on board and you have other people that are maybe not seasonal, that are a little bit more seasoned and permanent employees, they actually help these people guiding them through um, not just a day, not just a week, but maybe for a period of time that's longer than a week to really get through that hygiene process to understand the reasons why we need to do that. So you take your, your, your hygiene superheroes and you really turn them into teachers and leaders to help create additional hygiene superheroes. Uh, similarly, um, one mentioned that they have employees from a lot of different backgrounds. So what can be done to ensure hygiene among a very diverse team? It, same thing, really, again, it, one is, is one, if you're, you need to automate that process, because then it really bridges that, that human behavioral gap, as well as in that language barrier. Uh, you know, to tell a brief story, when I started in this industry 30 years ago, you know, I'd walk into a plant and you would you would get literally, you know, three, four different dialects of languages. I was in another plant earlier this year, pre-COVID, and there were 32 different dialects spoken in that plant. From a hygiene aspect, that's an incredibly challenging process. Can you create 30, 32 different you know, language posters, 32 different videos? Really difficult to do that. Again, that's where that team member mentor comes in, but also one of the biggest ways to bridge that gap is really to automate that process, to create that process flow, turn it from a manual process into automation like we've done with so many other parts of our lives will really help address that challenge, especially with a diverse work culture. So does Maritech host safety days? We do, and that's one of the things that we're really proud about. One of the things with Maritech that's unique and different, one of the things I get the opportunity to participate in a lot is really with uh, looking at, you go in and you look and do a site visit for a company, you see exactly what their process flow is, help them design that, but then you also help prior to implementing technologies or understanding what their challenges are, you really start working with them of how do you onboard these people correctly? How do you get them trained? And then how do you go back and reinforce that safety day? One of the things that's really important about safety days and when you work on those safety days with your companies is really when is the right time to do it? So for example, what you brought up earlier about those seasonal staff, right before they are coming on or right when they're coming on, when you get that largest peak of those seasonal staff, that's a good time to host a safety day so that you can get them all on board at the same time. But also utilize your other vendors that you use, the guys that support you know, and provide your frocks and smocks, the ones that provide your PPE. Um, you know, If you're, you're doing a captive footwear program or you have plant shoes or something, that that's a good opportunity at those times to really bring all those vendors together work in collaboration to really help the organization create a good safety program and a safety day that really then creates that awareness level, really delivers that why in a fun, easy uh, learning environment. And what you do is, again, right on that foundation, you start building that culture. Okay, we have one more question, kind of a, a wrap up, I think, to everything uh, that's been said here. How does clean tech work to clean hands? Excellent question. Um, it, it's really a very unique technology, and I'm so proud that we've had the opportunity to do what we do. 
Uh, how the system works is when you just really put your hands into the two open cylinders, immediately the system turns on and there's 40 nozzles in there and there's 20 per hand. There's eight around the wrist. There's another eight in a helical pattern and another four dedicated just to your fingertips on each hand. And what happens is there, the first thing it does in the first second, it rinses the hand. That's really key important is that you want your hand to be ready to be washed. You wanna make sure that it's it's damp and ready for the, the mixture of the antimicrobial solution that's mixed with the water to come in and wash. And then the, the system switches over and then it washes for five seconds, uh, washing the hand with this antimicrobial soap. And then at the end of that, for from second six through 12, it's giving you a potable water rinse. The whole cycle lasts 12 seconds. It's removing that 99.9% .9 of the pathogens, only consuming about a half a gallon of water and really makes it seamless for every employee. One of the things while well, these cylinders, they actually turn around your hand and these 40 nozzles go around your hand 23 times in a single 12 second cycle. So it's a pretty quick process. All right, so I'd like to thank you, Paul, for sharing all this information and for Meritech's co-sponsoring of the survey on which this, uh, this webinar was initially based. And thank you to all the participants who've taken their time to be a part of this.